what do we mean by clinical examination? So these are what we're going to be looking at as the content. We have introduction, uh, clinical examination, the principles, so clinical examination, we have a process, and then the accessories. What are those other things that we need to look at aside from uh, the animals? Uh, we need to look at the management, we need to look at the field, we need to look at the environment. Then what can we infer from our observations? And then last week, the disease of the week was Newcastle disease. But this week, the disease of the week is infectious bronchitis. What we expect to do is that you read up about infectious bronchitis, what is new about infectious bronchitis that you want to tell us, what are the pictures you've, made, you've seen on the field that you want to share with us. So that's the reason why we picked disease of the week. Uh, although we have not seen anybody do that, uh, probably I may have to even start something by myself. Just any about any information you think would be helpful for anybody all over the world that is talking about a uh, infectious disease or Newcastle disease. That of last week is, is still online, so you can still provide the information. So, but this week's one also will be online probably by this evening or by tomorrow, and you can provide information about. Infectious bronchitis, what do you know about infectious bronchitis? What have you seen about infectious bronchitis or pertaining your experience or regarding infectious bronchitis? Uh, what are the new things that you can tell us regarding infectious bronchitis? So, all, all of these are things you can do then. That is the continuous assessment will be around, uh, around that. So, let's start. Uh, let's go into it proper. Clinical examination, what is clinical examination? So, it's a comprehensive physical assessment of a patient. In this case, we're talking about bird, or you know, you cannot check just one or the flock. So it's the assessment of the patient that uh, provides an opportunity for the healthcare professional to obtain business information about the patient for either immediate and or future use. Now, it may be what you have got, information you have got from the physical examination may, it may provide immediate and immediate, it may be used immediately, and information you have got may be used in the future. So either immediate or future, they just know that whenever you are doing your clinical assessment, uh, which is clinical examination, is just for you to be used, is to use the information to help the patient as, an health, as, as, as a healthcare professional. So it's also used to establish possible causes of the observed clinical manifestation. So you don't use clinical examination just for intervention alone, but for you to also know these are the causes of what you are seeing. So that is what we want to pay attention to in our uh, lecture for today. And uh, we dive into it proper now that we have understood what clinical examination is. So what are the principles that we need to put at the back of our minds when we are running clinical examination on poultry. Number one is the more birds you examine in a flock, the more the clinical information you derive. I think you will be familiar with this, with this principle. Uh, when you want to examine, is, that's the reason why we decided to move poultry away from livestock and away from dogs because Poultry is very peculiar when you are talking about their own uh, physical examination. So you don't use just one to say, oh, this is what is wrong with the flock. So somebody has called you and the farmer has picked, for example, 5,000 birds, and then you have just picked two out of the 5,000 birds. When the farmer is complaining that he, he or she is saying mortality, you have picked one or two, and then you now use one or two to judge the whole 5,000 uh, birds of flock. So this is not going to be appropriate. And that's the reason why I say, the more birds you examine in the flock, the more the clinical information you derive. That is principle number one. Second principle, clinical examination is to narrow down your suspicion from clacking and history taking. You have already done uh, clacking and history taking uh, earlier because that is the first thing we expect you to do. And now when you have already done that, then the next thing that is expected is that you should be able to now narrow down all your suspicion. So you can then start thinking that, oh, how can I bring, I mean, bring down all the suspicion so you can do this 
uh, during clinical examination, you remember that clinical examination is for, for that purpose. To narrow down all that you have suspected while you were doing your clerking and the uh, history taking. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why you need to listen to that uh, uh, training or uh, presentation. That will be able to help you um, some of these things that we're talking about. The yeah, number three principle is that always remember to check the possible entry point of causative agents. So when you are doing your physical examination or clinical examination, always remember to put where could this have come from? You know, that, that's an important thing. Is it through water? Is it through the environment? Is it through hair? Is it through feed? Where is this clinical presentation that I'm seeing? Where is it coming from? So always use that and use clinical uh, uh, use clinical examination to find the entry point of causative agent. Now that's will now take us to a, a step further. Put in mind the possible avenue through which the causative agent can also be spread. Now, if you if you remember the definition of uh, clinical examination, we said for immediate or future use. Now, if you understand how it entered, and then you don't pay attention to how it is spread, it will be very hard for you to use that information to prevent the spread. Like I told you now, you may be dealing with 5,000 birds in a pen. And when we're dealing with 5,000 birds in a pen, and now you have known the entry point, the disease has already entered. Birds have started dying. That's the reason why you were called. Now, you understand the entry points, but you don't understand how it is being spread. How are you going to curtail it or uh, manage the situation so that other birds will not be affected? So more than just clinical examination, remember that you are supposed to put in mind how the disease or causative agent can also be spread to other, uh, other birds that are inside the same pen. So we are in the environment, whether the same pen or in the pen close by. Now, a five principle of clinical examination is that most clinical signs on the feed are a reflection of a mixed infection. Don't always forget this, because this is what many people forget, and then they want to narrow it down to a particular infection, that this is the singular infection that is causing this problem. We are not in school anymore. This is field. Most of the feed present themselves in, in, in form of a mixed infection. So we are not going to see just single infection when you are doing the clinical examination. Sometimes it may be two, sometimes it may be three, but there is one that will be more prominent than the other. So the one that is more prominent is the one that we even be very evident, but that does not mean that that's the only cause of the infection. There are some other things in the viral infection with secondary bacteria, super, uh, super infection, or even there is a viral infection and another viral super infection, Anything can be it. So mixed infection is what is usually possible when we talk about uh, when you are considering the clinical examination that you are doing, then diseases do not read books. I think you always remember this and you may want to remember this. So that you will not say because you have seen swollen highs, you have seen, uh, you have seen, you have seen uh, sneezing and coughing and reels, and then you have seen swollen highs, and then you are seeing diarrhea. You say, ah, no, with what I'm seeing now, uh, this is not pointing towards anything that looks like infectious bronchitis. Or you are seeing greenish, greenish diarrhea, you are seeing nervous sign, and then you are seeing uh, some other respiratory infection. And then you say, ah, this must only be a Newcastle disease. You cannot just narrow it down because diseases don't read books. We are the ones that have read diseases. And we have said that, okay, from some of our observation, this is how diseases go. Uh, diseases go. And uh, this is what are the things you are going to see when you are looking at Newcastle diseases. These are the things you're going to see in infections. Because we are the ones that write books based on what we have observed. So that means you can still observe new things, even in the same, I mean, uh, regarding the same diseases in different environments. And that's why when you hear diseases do not read books, that means it, they don't follow the pattern of what you have been taught in the school. It may be different because they are in a different environment. It may be different because of the fact that they have been vaccinated. It may be different because the fact that they use excess drugs. It may be different because of the fact that there is a plactoxin inside the feed. What you are going to be seeing may be quite different from what you have always been reading in the books. 
So you read books, not diseases. And that's why you shouldn't close your mind that, oh, they've taught, taught me that when I see Newcastle diseases, this is the way it will follow. Then if it's not following that way, then it's not Newcastle disease. No, diseases do not read books. You are the one that reads books. But diseases will show you what will make you know that it is tending towards a particular one. And that is the importance of a clinical. So don't forget that when you are doing your clinical examination. So what are the process? So number one is that you do not assume. Because that's what many people do. They just assume, well, uh, just like I said, since I'm seeing nervous, I'm seeing respiratory, I'm seeing digestive, these must be Newcastle disease. It's not compulsory that it must be Newcastle. In short, it may be an infection that is completely new, completely new. Probably they have not even given it a name. So don't just be under assumption that because you are seeing this, then you can be sure that this is what it is. I don't expect anybody to be given definitive diagnosis during clinical examination. So you will still have different suspicion. All you need to do is to narrow it down from what you have done with uh, during clacking and uh, risk taking. So do not assume, try as much as possible to be sure. So you have to be exhaustive in your examination in order for you to be able to have a uh, assurance of what you're talking about because you're a medical practitioner. You know, many people don't understand the reason why during school days, you are always told to answer all questions because they don't expect you not to know anything as a medical practitioner. You are expected to know everything. So we don't, we are not told to answer two or answer three out of five. You are expected to answer all questions because as a medical practitioner, you are supposed to know everything that has to do with the medical, uh, medical, uh, uh, medical instruction information. So number two is that observe the pen or house design and construction. Sometimes it may not have anything to do with uh, the birds themselves. It may be that the way the house or the pen has been constructed is uh, not helping cross ventilation. Uh, it is so dirty to the extent that there are a lot of cobwebs and uh, that may be like a formite for an entry of infection. So more than just uh, looking at the bird, you can also look at the hardware the house has been constructed uh, to be able to inform you. Then observe individual animals. That is very important. Look at them from afar. Look at them when you are very close and uh, listen to what you can hear, perceive the smell. Just use your five senses to be able to see okay, what's actually happening to individual animals. Now, there are times in which individual animals present different clinical manifestation. In short, this is lovely. And that is when you will know that diseases do not read books. Five animals may be infected in the same way, and the five of them may be showing different clinical manifestation. So that is very important for us to be able to know that, okay, this animal, it may be the load of viral, and the viral load that is the cause of the fact that this one is not showing a particular clinical uh, presentation. At another time, it may not be the load, it may be the immune system. The immune system of this one is stronger than the other. So there are different reasons why the same, I mean, different animal infected with the same disease will be showing you different clinical manifestations. So try to check individual animal, record what you are seeing in individual animals because you may eventually pull them together to arrive at your, uh, at your uh, differential diagnosis. Then observe the flock in their house see how they are doing. Sometimes uh, when you go to a brooding pen, you may see them away from this, from the, uh, from the uh, heat that has been made. Uh, that is giving you a story that uh, the heat is becoming too much. Sometimes they may be clawed together in the same place. That's the fact that there is a source of heat. That's an indication that is not sufficient. Uh, so many other things, you just enter into the pen, try to observe. Because some of the time when people tell you that mortality, mortality, you, you have to observe some of those things, uh, what we call uh, the reaction of the, in the, of the birds, especially when they are in the flock. So the, the, the flock, uh, let me say the flock design, uh, let me say the, for, the, 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 the way the flock behave, the flock behavior can also tell you a story about the disease. And then lastly, you observe each uh, sorry, I, I was supposed to write birds there, each bird systematically. So each of the birds, you are supposed to observe them systematically. Check 
if there are nervous problems, if you have checked the nervous problem, you have looked at their gaze, you've looked at twitching, twitching you've looked like the uh, torticolis uh, or some form of um, other nervous uh, signs, then you can go to okay, respiratory, yeah, are they coughing, are they sneezing? What are they showing you uh, to, to uh, do, do, do you, can you hear reels? What, what are those things that you can, you can perceive? So you will check the respiratory, you go to digestive. Uh, do they have a greenish diarrhea? Do they have white diarrhea? Do they have yellowish diarrhea? You observe that too. Then you can also look at reproductive. In reproductive, you can see the type of egg that they are laying, especially for the laying birds. Is it shellless egg? Is it, um, is it a rough shell egg? What is the type of egg? Is it small egg? Um, you can also use that to help in the conclusion of your uh, diagnosis. Then you can check the integument, check their leg, check their eyes, especially the non-feathered area. You can check all of those areas and see if there are swellings or uh, there are pores or there are all of those will help you to be able to get uh, uh, information uh, regarding uh, what you are actually showing. So what are the accessories? So after you have looked at this important, uh, there are some accessories you should also consider, and that is um, about the system of managing the flock. What is their feeding pattern, uh, especially for broilers? Are they feeding them hard to be too, or the are trying to be economical in their approach and thereby, thereby starving some of the birds. If we want to check their lighting system, which is important for laying birds, if we want to check the staff attitude, are they actually willing to work or they are being reluctant? Are they the one um, being negligent that is, causing, that is causing the animal to die? Check the attitude, check the cleanliness of the pen, of the material they are using, the uh, feeding trough, check the watering trough, check the tank, you may, all of those things are important. Just check the management because that may be the reason for the disease. Then number two is that you observe the environment, check the check the feces, smell, look at the ventilation, look at the litter, is the litter damp or wet that will be able to allow microorganism to thrive. All of these are things you should check during your clinical examination. Then you can also check the source of drinking water because this is another important thing. There was a farm that I went to that the only problem they have is the source of drinking water. The more they were doing the treatment, the part, so far the drinking water is coming from the same source. There was recurrence of the same disease. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So they are treating the animal, the animal will get better, but because they are still using the same source of water, the, the, the disease will recur again, uh, just because of the source of uh, drinking water. Then number four is that you check the feed material. Sometimes it may be the component, how are they compounding their feed? Too much excessive carbohydrates uh, or excessive uh, fat that may lead to fatty liver. You know, check all of the component or excessive carbohydrates uh, that may eventually lead to fatty liver uh, hemorrhagic uh, syndrome, or probably they don't have sufficient protein, or probably there is no sufficient calcium for laying birds. Just try to look at the component, then check the proportion too of what they are compounding and then check the expiry date because some of them might have expired and they may still be using it just because they don't want to dispose of them. So all of those things are things you should check in order to get information about what, uh, what is wrong with the, uh, with the birds. So what can you infer from all of these uh, long stories? Number one is that uh, for you to make a reasonable inference, you have to record all your observations. If you have uh, observed all the things I've said, so anyone that you've seen that, okay, has a problem in all of those, you can make sure that you, you, you record all, of your, all your observation. Then you start, you start to eliminate the unlikely diagnosis. Like I said, during the clerking and history taking that you should have a list of, of uh, likely diseases that is causing the uh, based on your clerking and the uh, and the uh, history taking, but from this ex clinical examination, to be able to eliminate some of them that are not likely. Now uh, this is not likely. This is not likely. This is not likely. This is not likely. Then uh, number three is that non-infectious diseases can also be the cause of mortality. So don't concentrate so solely on infectious diseases. Like I told you, ordinary the, the fact that uh, 
uh, a farm is using um, a, an expired product of um, additives, feed additives, the animal started dying. They started dying of a, a lack of vitamins in their feed. So sometimes it may just be something that's simple and insignificant that you may not even pay attention to, and that may be the cause of the mortality. So you have to pay attention to non-infectious diseases also because they may also be the cause uh, of mortality. Then always remember, like I said earlier, that feed diseases are usually from mixed infection. So don't 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 be so uh, don't be so dogmatic and be so uh, spectacular that it must be this particular disease that is causing the infection. Because you, you may eventually treat that disease and you may see the recurrence because the real cause of what you are observing, you have not taken care of it. It may be a viral infection that is very chronic. And then there is a uh, there is an a second bacterial infection that is very uh, very acute, and then you can take out the uh, acute um, second bacterial infection without necessarily touching the viral infection. And then because the viral infection still persists, then the acute the secondary bacterial infection may eventually come back again. And then all that you have done may be eventually wasted. So always remember that uh, feed diseases are usually from mixed infection. So always find a way of bringing out the detail of all the likely diseases that might have been the cause of, uh, of what you are seeing on the feed. So like I said, the disease of the week is uh, infectious bronchitis and I decided to put some information about infectious bronchitis here. So this slide will also be going online for this week. And then, like I said, I we are, you are expected to mention anything that you have known about infectious bronchitis. Uh, every any image that you have taken, a personal image, or probably during your postmortem examination, or probably there is the new information about infectious bronchitis, especially in Nigeria, you can put it uh, online. So this will be found on all our social media platforms. So you can just follow it and then be able to gather information and put it there so that we may be able to... So one thing we should know about the of bronchitis is that as, a, as simple and... and, and a, because if you look at mortality rate, it may, the highest form of mortality rate is just 30%. But the economic hard disadvantage is one of the reasons why you have to focus on infectious bronchitis because it can eventually lead to high loss of money if it is on the field. So that is the use of the week. And then the continuous assessment is that for infectious localities, just like I said, give information on that you have gathered on infectious localities so that uh, you may be able to, we may be able to also learn uh, from, from, from that so that we may be able to learn from that. And while we, okay, so yeah, thank you for listening. I don't know if there are questions, if there are any questions, although we are not supposed to do question and answer on this platform, uh, we are supposed to use another one, but I think I can answer one or two questions uh, before we, uh, if there are more, then we can go ahead and do another, uh, and go to another, uh, another platform to ask questions. So you can, if you have questions, you can raise up your hand uh, or mute your mic and then you can ask your question. Alishina, you are welcome. Well, you came very, very late. Sure, we had already completed the training. This uh, it was supposed to be 30 minutes training. How are you doing?
So uh, if there are no questions, um, I think we can just call it a day. But if you have a question, like I said, you can raise up your hands. And if you don't know how to raise up your hands, you can just unmute your microphone and then ask your question. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Okay, okay. I just wanted to be sure so that it won't be that because you cannot hear me, that's why you're not asking questions. Okay, so if there are no questions, Dr. Victor, is it that you have questions or we should uh, call it a day? Okay, so uh, since um, since I'm not too sure if there is any question, so we're going to be meeting next week. Uh, the time is three p.m., but we will have opened the uh, we will have opened the Zoom by uh, two fifty-five p.m. for people that want to join, so that you can participate. And like I said, you can also still invite other people to join us. But by the time we distribute the um, the project topics, we may not be able to accommodate anybody anymore. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we are going to make available this uh, this recording after the day, so that you'll be able to also have access to information that you might have missed. All right, thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, let me say um, thank you and bye for now. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Sir.